In recent decades, millions of people have drifted away from Jesus and their Catholic faith. Sadly, many may never find their way back. I'm Tom Peterson, and I believe that God has called me to use my background in media to be a catalyst in the new evangelization. Our organization produces inspiring and creative evangelization messages that have helped lead hundreds of thousands of inactive Catholics, converts, agnostics, and atheists home to Jesus and His Holy Church. Join us as we travel across North America to bring you stories of heartbreak, redemption, and transformation as the Holy Spirit leads His people home. God has an extraordinary plan for each of our lives. He wants us to spend eternity in heaven with Him and bring as many people with us as possible. This is Catholics Come Home. Now, I welcome you to my home to hear their amazing stories. Welcome to Catholics Come Home. In this episode, we'll meet a married couple. His father was an Episcopal minister and a professor of patristics. Her faith was not strong as a child, but she found God while battling alcoholism in college. Over the years, this couple married and began seeking the one true church guided by the Holy Spirit. Their amazing journey led them home into the Catholic faith and him to serve as a deacon in a Catholic parish. Like everybody else in this series, today's guest came home to the Catholic Church by responding to a call of the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to meet Deacon Brad and Helen Young. Deacon Brad and Helen, welcome to our home and welcome home to the Catholic Church. Thank, Thank you. you. Our viewers love to hear youth stories, how, where you grew up, what your family was like, what your religious background and practices were. So Helen, let's start with you. I grew up in Atlanta uh -huh. and um, not in a religious home at all. I was baptized Episcopalian, but my family was really Christmas and Easter only. Didn't have much, not much prayer in the house not much religious formation at all, wow. but really a warm and loving household and a lot of moral values. So I was morally well-formed, but didn't know God at all. Wow. Was offered the opportunity to be confirmed at 13 and declined it. Wow. Mostly because I didn't, I followed my dad, the lead of my dad, and he wasn't religious at all. And so I didn't get confirmed. You were honest, at least, but about it. Yeah. I was honest. You didn't go through the motions. I did, which was yeah. important to me. Yeah. I'm a very authentic person, and that kind of came through at age 13. So, But that was my whole childhood was really focused on tennis. Tennis was oh. God in our family. My dad wow. was a big tennis player. We all played tennis. So I grew up playing tennis, going to tennis tournaments, and then ended up wanting to play college tennis. Wow. So tennis was our family God. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you did on Sunday. That, yeah. we did it <laughs> and every, every other day of the week. <laughs> every day of the week, but definitely on Sundays too, yeah. Understood. So I'm one of five children. My uh, father was an Episcopal priest oh, who then decided wow. after a couple of years that he wanted to be a professor of church history. Oh. So I was born in Boston because he was going back to graduate school there. Wow. We were a very churchy family. Um, in the Episcopal Church, there's a strain called Anglo-Catholics. They kind of see what Rome does and kind of cherry pick what is fun for them. And of course, there's not much discipline there, so they kind of do what they want to do. And we were sort of high church Episcopalians. And then we, uh, my parents bought a house in uh, Surrey, Virginia, which is a very low church Episcopal diocese. So we went to four different churches uh, over the course of a month quite trying to go to Holy Communion services. So was your family looking for a church to attend in Virginia, or was your dad serving at those different parishes? Uh, he would fill in from time to time, but we were going as parishioners, for lack of a better word. Trying to find a home. Um, trying to carve our own worship experience, ah, I think I would see. be the best way to describe it, yes. Would you say you had a deep relationship with Christ as a child because of having a dad who was an Episcopal pastor? In a narrow way, yes. Not the... Um, not the sort of the evangelical experience, yeah. very intellectual. He was a, a, Justin Martyr was what he wrote his dissertation on. So I was that weird kid who knew who Justin Martyr was at age 10, <laughs> but had never heard of Joe Namath. Oh, wow, uh, yeah, that's, that's unique. <laughs> when did you first start experiencing faith and start looking into faith? Was it much later in life? I did have a few friends in high school. Looking back at my whole life, I can see how God always planted people of faith in my life, but I always pushed them away. So yeah. I didn't really find faith 
until I got sober in 1987. Wait, you say you got sober. Did you have a drinking problem? So in college, I went crazy hmm. and had a big drinking problem. Now it was the 80s. And you I must be the only college student <laughs> who ever had a drinking problem. Right, and I have had friends say to me, but Helen, we were all doing that. My college career was definitely different than that of all my friends. I wrecked cars, I failed out of school twice. Wow. It took me five years to get through. I dropped out for a while, I came back. I really had a drinking problem. And through that, I found Alcoholics Anonymous. Praise God. Praise God. And that is the place that I first found faith. And wow. in AA, you first call God your higher power. Probably by meeting three, I knew that the higher power was God. So I'm very wired for God, we all are, yes. but I was very receptive to the idea that God was intervening in my life and things were gonna get better. So that's really the first place I found faith was AA meetings. So I'm very grateful to AA for getting me sober, but also because I found God there. So a much bigger, more important thing even. And then I met Brad in AA. Huh. I too had a drinking problem in college. <laughs> yeah. Were you in Boston? No problem at the time, drinking. Or? It was the, the after effects. Oh, ah, okay. <laughs> in Charlottesville. Oh, okay. Charlottesville. We both went to Virginia. Yeah, I got you. So in Charlottesville, Alcoholics Anonymous is where we met. And um, you're not supposed to date in Alcoholics Anonymous. We broke that rule. Oh. Um, and got married. And so all the people that told us that we shouldn't date, we sent wedding invitations to. <laughs> Good for you. Well, God had it in store for you. He it did. It's meeting in a bar. At least you met at a recovery program. Exactly. That's better. So exactly. when you were first met, um, did you discuss faith? Was it on the radar or did that come later in your I marriage? don't think so. The great thing about AA is it gives you a working faith apparatus mm -hmm. without calling it that. And I, I agree with what Helen said, that I finally realized that my higher power was the triune God that I had been raised in. But because I didn't have to call him that, it freed me to embrace him. Uh, so it really was a gift for, for me particularly, but for all of us, um, to have a God who would speak to us when we spoke to Him, as opposed to be some remote thing that told you on Monday what you should have done on Saturday night. He was there with you on Saturday night. It was a tremendous jump start for um, my faith journey. In a moment, find out what prompted Brad and Helen to discover more about the Catholic faith. And I was pregnant with our first and that's when we began to think, oh, the Episcopal Church might not be right for us. I was actually raised in the Catholic Church. I, I um, went to grade school uh, through sixth grade, and pretty much about the time I went to high school, um, I stopped attending church and really didn't think much more about it for a number of years. The return to church, the Catholic Church, was somewhat of an evolution. I thought I knew what the Catholic Church believed and taught, but uh, learned very quickly from somebody who knew far more about the Bible than I ever hoped to know. Uh, I learned that the Catholic Church, what it truly taught, and that that's where I needed to be. I'm a recovered alcoholic and drug addict. Without God in my life, I'd probably be dead. God has literally saved my life. I feel like I'm truly on the road to um, the fulfillment of, of really all of my desires, uh, which is ultimately to spend attorney in heaven with myself and my family. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for whatever reason, we invite you to take another look. Visit catholicscomehome.org today. So you guys met in Alcoholics Anonymous. Faith was part of your life, but it wasn't really strong in your life. What was the next chapter on your faith journey as now a married couple uh, starting a family and... Well, I think our return to sort of organized religion came through the marriage prep. Yeah. Uh, the Episcopal Church has a marriage prep program somewhat similar to the Catholic that you're going to meet with a priest. Mm -hmm. And Helen is a truth speaker and she said, if we're going to do this, we probably ought to go to church. So we started going to an Episcopal Church in Richmond, Virginia, where we were living. And that began the process of sort of reacquainting ourselves with a God who knew us and loved us and we could know him and love him back. And keeping holy the Sabbath and getting into a routine. How much later did the kids come along and were they part of that going to Sunday Mass? When we got engaged and I said, if we're gonna get married in the church, we're gonna to go to church. And then we really began to go to church and buy into 
the idea of having a religious family, and that was all uh, new for me. Okay. Um, and I loved that Brad's family had always gone to church. They never missed, you did not, if you were young, you didn't miss Sunday church. And they even called it mass because they were Anglo-Catholic. So they didn't miss mass on Sunday. So that was part of our routine. Mm -hmm. So our family, Brad and Helen family, was very much, we were very oriented to going to church on Sunday. And for me, that was so refreshing to get to experience what it's like to live with God. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my first experience really with liturgy, ongoing liturgy, how to live with liturgy. It was beautiful. And we didn't have kids for seven years. So then once we started thinking about having kids, we were thinking, wow, well, what do we want to raise our kids in this church? And I was pregnant with our first, and that's when we began to think, oh, the Episcopal Church might not be right for us. At this point, we had moved to Atlanta, and we had been going to an Anglo-Catholic church here in Atlanta. I had gotten involved with an evangelical Bible study, and that was tremendous for my own growth because yes. these guys read the Bible as these were their friends. These characters and the stories were their friends. Yeah. Um, it was lovely for me. The heroes who went before us who can show us the way because they've walked exactly. the same road that we're walking. Exactly. exactly. And then um, along the way, I had become concerned that, you know, the, the, sh the shepherd's job is to take care of the sheep. Uh -huh. And in the Episcopal Church, the shepherd seemed to be completely unhinged and I didn't feel safe. And so I began to think that there's only one church that is guaranteed protection by the Holy Spirit and that we probably should think about being Catholic. And what made you think that? Well, I mean, I know, but I wanna know what made you think that. Well, at the time, of course, we had a wonderful witness of Catholicism in now Saint John Paul II, ah. um, but he was a personal ev evangelist just in how he carried himself, Amen. his joy for life, his willingness to defend the truth um, in the face of a culture that is really denying truth. Uh, so it was a powerful draw for me to uh, look at him and then read him. And when you mentioned your concern with, with Episcopal shepherds, was it on the moral issues of our day? Indeed. It was the fact that they didn't defend life, yeah. they didn't defend marriage, and I can't find anything in the scriptures where it says we're allowed to redefine things that God has defined. <laughs> and that really made me feel nervous. We had Father Dwight Longenecker on our show in the past, and he came from a Anglican background, mm -hmm. and same issues caused him to start looking further and yeah. deeper and eventually convert to the Catholic faith. And we thank God for his witness. He's a great pillar of mm -hmm. our church. Yes. So your family now starts investigating Catholicism. What was the next step in your faith journey as a family? Well, when Brad told me we were gonna be Catholic, I was stunned. Um, he, he kept, we had been talking, having the discussion about what to do. And I said, he said, Helen, I th I've been praying about it and I think we should be Catholic. And I really was silent for a moment. My first comment was my mother's going to be angry that my children won't be baptized at St. Luke's in Atlanta. Which and, was a, a which Anglican is an Episcopal, Episcopal church. Yes. Yeah. Where multiple generations have been baptized. Oh. And then the next thing out of my mouth was absolutely inspired by the Holy Spirit because I said, you're the spiritual head of the family. I will follow you where you lead. Praise God. It was praise yeah, God. It yeah. was probably the first truly submissive thing I had done as a wife. It was a huge turning point. <laughs> it was tremendous. So thank you, Holy Spirit. Were there others after that, Brad? Uh, <laughs> yeah, good. Every day. Okay, I just want to make sure. Every day. <laughs> Not many. So you're now becoming Catholic. Your kids are being baptized Catholic. Uh, where did the story take a turn next? Well, interestingly enough, our firstborn was baptized in February and we were received into the church in March. So he's awesome. the first Catholic he's the first in our Catholic. family. Wow. And he loves Good to for him. That. He took the lead. Yes, <laughs> he took the lead. And then we have uh, two other kids and they were both, um, of course, baptized Catholic. And, sure. and then we lived, this is an amazing story. We bought a house when I was pregnant, three blocks from the cathedral mm -hmm. and weren't Catholic at the time. And so when we became Catholic, we had a neighborhood church and a neighborhood school, which we could walk to. So what a tremendous, it was yes, prepared ahead of time for you. It's beautiful. Yeah. So that was wonderful. And our kids went to school there. They've had all their sacraments there. My oldest is married. He was married there. So we really had a beautiful family life oriented around Christ the King. So we want to know, because I called you Deacon Brad, when did your um, vocational calling come and how did it come? Well, we fairly quickly got involved um, on the service side of our faith. Both of us got involved with RCIA. We gave talks on marriage and things like that. Um, so I was intellectually interested in it. Um, and then 
um, probably about after five or ten years of being a Catholic, I, I sort of gingerly inquired about what it like to be a deacon, and I was told, you, you know, you need to be a Catholic longer, <laughs> uh, which was good advice and wise, wise advice. Mm -hmm. So then I applied, I actually heard Deacon Dennis Dorner, who's the head of our permanent deacons, preach at the cathedral that we need more deacons at the cathedral. And so I responded by reaching out to Good him. For you. And then a year later I applied and spent five years in their formation program and I was ordained in 2017. We thank God you're a deacon and thank God you're a deacon's wife because I know the support has to be there. It's a it joint it venture, is. isn't it? Is. it? it is. It's a vocation for both the husband and the it wife. Is. At this point in your life, how has your family grown in its Catholicism? What things are you learning about your faith that you didn't know when you first became Catholic? I think the, one of the most important things that I have learned is obedience. Mm -hmm. When you're Protestant, you pretty much do what you want to do. And so having structure and hierarchy and rules to follow was very helpful for me in getting to know God and in learning how to um, grow in let, allowing God to l let me grow internally in my spiritual life. So obedience and um, prayer. You're talking about three legs of the stool and one of those is obviously the, the magisterium or the authority of the church so that they're going to pass on and teach to you what the catechism teaches, what the Bible teaches, what Jesus taught so that if you do mass mass on Sunday, you know you're not supposed to. We're, in other faith communities, it's not a big deal if you don't go to church on Sunday. They want you to come, but if you don't make it, it's no big deal. That's what you're alluding to. Yes. Yeah. And I would say for me, the sacramental life has been just such a source of enrichment. The understanding that God has given himself to me in sanctifying grace. And then when I mess up, we've got a system for me to go in and say, I messed up. And he says, I know, I love you. Don't do it again. Get back out there. Right? Amen. Reconciliation. And it's mm -hmm. uh, just, a, it's so real. And so... Um, natural that we would, we don't, we're not perfect and yet we're called to be perfect and so each day I can try to be a little bit more perfect by God's help. We developed a few years ago a confession site called goodconfession.com to promote the most underutilized sacrament we have in the church, the car wash for our souls. <laughs> and isn't it neat that we serve a God who gives us do-overs, second, yes. third, millionth chances if we merely just turn to Him and ask. And I'm glad you mentioned that because for those viewers out there who haven't been to the sacrament in a while, we encourage them, now is your time to go and get a fresh start. It is such a beautiful sacrament. It is, it's just so, it is a fresh start and God fills us. Amen. And you come out with more yes. energy, enthusiasm right on the track and you get rid of all the accusers comments to you and all that mm -hmm. junk that he pollutes you with where you're, you're starting over, which is beautiful. Yeah, that's why, uh... King David and St. Peter are two of my favorite characters from the scriptures because they were both fallen men, did really wicked things, and yet King David was the model we're waiting for and St. Peter is the rock of the church. So yeah. what an encouragement for the rest of us. Praise God. Yeah. Coming up, you'll hear the conclusion of the Young's conversion to Catholicism and learn more about Brad's vocation as a deacon. We may be the Bible that other people read, and that's, that's our opportunity and our vocation. How do you figure out what is right and what is wrong? Well, if your core beliefs are shaped by your culture or the world that is always changing, then you are probably on this road. But if your beliefs are based on truth that never changes, then you are likely over here. So which is right? Well, moral relativism means you can kind of make up your morality as you go. If you decide you want to change what's right and wrong, Moral relativism says that's okay. Yet those over here say that there is one truth that never changes. Here you always know what is right and wrong. John Paul II warned us at the end of this road we will find the culture of death. Those who are on this road believe that God would not create humanity and then stop short of telling his children exactly what is right and what is wrong. It is because of this that we believe that at the end of this road, we will truly find the fullness of life. Deacon Brad and Helen, we thank God that you're so deep into your Catholic faith now. 
I'd like to know what feeds your faith. What gives you that extra oomph to go deeper in faith? I know you mentioned in our last segment, the sacrament of reconciliation gives you that fresh start. What other things feed your faith and help you to then share that faith with others? For me, it's definitely prayer. I, for years, prayer comes very easily to me. And so for years, I sort of took for granted what was a regular conversation with God. And I would have these these conversations, sometimes daily, but sometimes not. And then about three years ago, through a formation for a spiritual direction school, I learned the importance of regular daily prayer time at the same time with a routine, really opening an intimacy with the Lord. And it has absolutely changed my life. So daily prayer, which is a conversation with God, is my anchor, but, but plus the sacraments. But prayer and the sacraments are the two things that hold me, that excite me, and constantly trying to learn more about my faith. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. Do you pray when you paint or create the icons you create? Because I know you're an iconographer as well now. So I'm just a beginner at painting mm -hmm. icons. Um, I have a great friend who has taught me. It's been a tremendous gift. And when you paint, you pray. Yes. Even when you don't know it, who you are painting, whoever you're portraying, that seems to be the, the charisms of that saint yes. or Mar Mother Mary or Jesus those defining qualities come into you. It's very beautiful, beautiful. And, and really been an incredible experience to paint icons. Deacon Brad, what feeds your faith? Well, you know, deacons are ordained to service. You know, we're not consecrated as the priests and the bishops are. And I have to say, serving the parish community, is it, it fills me up. It's wonderful to see, we're blessed with a wonderful, vibrant parish, St. Catharines, but to see these families and their children and the young and the old and the black and the white and every come it's in. Truly come, a universal it parish, is a isn't Catholic it? Yes. parish. And it is wonderful to see us all coming together to worship in community, our, our God, um, and it really fills my soul, and I'm so pleased to be able to serve in that regard. I, I think anyone who is in uh, church service or has a vocation of sorts, whether it's evangelization, a deacon, more formally or whatever, it, it, it feeds you when you see other people's lives being enriched when you share faith with them. And you want to do it even more then. And hopefully they'll do the same thing and we'll have the domino effect, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. We are in some tough times in our world. Some would say we're in some tough times in our church. As an ordained deacon, what wisdom and advice can you give us during these challenging times? Well, I do a fair amount of wedding prep and I tell young couples that in an interesting way, I think we might be where the early church was under the Roman Empire. We have a pagan analogy. state mm -hmm. that had denies the realities that we know about life and marriage and we have a chance individually to change the culture, one family, one child at a time. Yeah. We may be the Bible that other people read, and that's, that's our opportunity and our vocation. Very well said. Helen, what do you think about these times? What advice would you give? Eyes on Jesus. Mm -hmm. that, that has been um, a motto over the last couple of years, is when things get tough, just focus on Jesus. He is keep our rock, simple. <laughs> and keep it simple. Yeah. He'll always provide. Amen. As we conclude our episode together, and I thank you for sharing your testimonies, what do you know now that you didn't know as a kid growing up in a secular home playing tennis, uh, growing up in Boston in kind of a high church uh, Anglican home or Episcopal home? What do you know now that you didn't know then? The love of God, the transformative power of the love of God in my life. The fullness of the faith. Praise God. Well, we thank God for your faith journey. Thank you for sharing it with our audience. And we will keep you in prayer. Please keep us in prayer. And uh, we praise God. Welcome home. Thank, thank you, you so much. Let's talk about the virtues. Practicing the virtues helps us grow in holiness, renew our culture, and become the saints that God created us to be. This week, we'll focus on the virtue of temperance. Temperance is a virtue that moderates our attraction and desire for pleasure, and, as the Catechism states, provides balance in the use of created goods. St. Thomas Aquinas calls temperance a disposition of the mind which binds the passions. Temperance helps us strengthen our wills against the sin of gluttony. While gluttony is unrestrained in its consumption of food, drink, or other pleasures, perhaps things like media in our overconnected world today, Temperance practices healthy moderation. 
You've probably heard people say, or maybe have used the phrase yourself, it's all about moderation. Well, it really is. More accurately, it's about temperance. Living with temperance frees us to use material goods in a proportion that is best for us and will bring us the most happiness in the end. Our culture today seizes after instant gratification, but temperance helps us achieve long-term joy and fulfillment. Here are some ideas to help you increase in temperance. First, and quite simply, moderate your food and drink. Practice not eating past the point of being full or drinking to excess. Next, avoid excess in other areas of your life. Do you have an attachment to buying a lot more clothes or gadgets than you need? Are you using social media too much? Romans 13, 14 exhorts, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Reflect on the areas of your life in which you have a difficult time practicing moderation. Then write down a tangible goal to cut back, making more room for temperance and consequently freedom and joy. Here's your opportunity to grow in faith and help Jesus save souls. Visit our CatholicsComeHome.org website and click on the Shop tab. Here, you can discover our four brand new popular books to help you and those you love grow closer to Christ. The Willpower Advantage, Building Habits for Lasting Happiness, includes a personal spiritual audit and a customized plan to help you fight lifelong vices and find freedom in Christ. One Moment Can Change a Soul, helps you guide family and friends home to the Catholic faith. Plus, two beautifully illustrated children's books to help your children or grandchildren stay close to Jesus. Epic, the story of Jesus' Holy Catholic Church and Santa's Priority, keeping Christ in Christmas. You can also order a car magnet to evangelize in traffic, evangelization cards, and DVDs with all of our best episodes of our international television series. If you have a question or want to tell us how Catholics Come Home has blessed someone you know, or you can financially help us blitz the secular airwaves with these powerful evangelicals, contact us at info at catholicscomehome.org or by mail. Catholics Come Home, P.O. Box 1802, Roswell, Georgia 30077. Please help Jesus save more souls. Growing increasingly concerned at the changes and errors in the Episcopal faith, the young family began a quest for Jesus' one true church. While Helen was initially concerned about her mother's reaction to becoming Catholic, she trusted her husband's lead and both converted to the Catholic faith in 1996. As a result, they've experienced a love story that unfolded into divine intimacy with Christ. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Catholics Come Home. Please keep the young family and all of us at Catholics Come Home in your prayers. Remember to fulfill your role in the new evangelization by helping to love somebody to heaven.